Scott, let's talk about your op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. It, it touches on something or it expounds on something that you brought up here on Squawk Box last week on Friday when the CDC came out and changed the guidelines to say that kids can now be sitting three feet apart instead of six feet apart. It's left a lot of us scratching our heads trying to figure out what was the science that went into it to the first place and what's the new science? And have we been wrong this entire time keeping kids six feet apart or are we doing things because it's more politically expedient now? What, what, what do you think? How, how are we supposed to navigate this um, just as consumers? Well, I think at a high level, when we started implementing precautions to protect against coronavirus, we went back to a flu model. Um, and it was reasonable to do that because we didn't know a lot about the coronavirus, so we assumed it was going to behave like flu. It has not behaved like flu, and that has caused us to both overestimate and underestimate this virus in some important ways. And it isn't so much a question of were we wrong about that. We were wrong in certain respects, but did we learn quickly enough and did we adapt our recommendations and guidelines quickly enough? And the answer is no. Um, because we thought that this spread like flu, we overestimated the role of contaminated surfaces. Uh, we overestimated the utility of physical distancing because flu spreads predominantly through droplet transmission. We know droplets don't spread more than about six feet. We underestimated the role of air quality and high quality masks because we underappreciated that this was spreading through aerosol transmission. So there were some important ways that we both overestimated and underestimated this virus. And I don't think we learned quickly enough. And then when we did, we didn't revisit our guidelines. One of the virtues of the CDC process is that CDC is able to move very quickly in issuing recommendations. One of the obligations you have for being able to move very quickly is that you have to have an institutionalized process to revisit these things. And that's what we didn't have here. And the other piece of it is that when CDC issues recommendations, um, there's different levels of evidence behind those recommendations and different levels of certainty. And when the, the agency is uncertain or is predicating a recommendation on less certain science, they really should be transparent around that so we can make an interpretation how seriously we want to take it. Um, but they don't usually do that. I think they ought to be obligated to do that. Yeah. I, I have to say, Dr. Gottlieb, I've never seen anything like this before, where the CDC is basically the CYA for every organization out there. There's no politician who wants to come down on one side or the other of this and alienate 40 or 50 percent of the voters. So politicians won't make decisions. It puts workplaces and schools at a point where the only way that they can protect themselves is say that they are following CDC guidelines. So this is incredibly important um, public policy. It's incredibly important political science and science all kind of mixed up together. And I've never seen the CDC have to maneuver something like this before, but they're more important than ever. Well, they, they always are important because their pronouncements are followed by a lot of um, local districts, a lot of businesses. You always const you constantly hear people referencing CDC guidelines. And so, you know, these, these guidelines have more impact on the economy than regulation, but there's no notice and comment. There's no obligation for public advisory committees, outside input. There needs to be more transparency around how these things get formulated. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.